If any of you are interested in creating passive income and productizing your business so you have more free time, this is going to be a great episode for you. I have the e-commerce queen herself, Christina Scalera, as today's special guest, today's female on fire. And she is the attorney and founder behind the contract shop. By the way, to all of my entrepreneurs, personal brands, you gotta check out her shop. If you need support with having, with creating contract templates and things like that, it's a whole contract template store for creative entrepreneurs, wedding professionals, coaches, and it's such a brilliant idea. So make sure you go and check that out. And in this episode, Christina actually shares what she went through in arriving at what she has now created her seven figure Shopify store, she really hit rock bottom at one point in her life. She shares this and how she was racking up $78,000 of credit card debt. She quit her nine to five to pursue a passion project that totally flopped. And nonetheless, she was able to create this super successful seven figure Shopify store that also allows her to have so much free time because all of it really is this passive income. And since she was able to create this for herself, she strongly believes that digital downloads are really the way to have your business run on autopilot. And she's really helping others turn their services into products so that you can have your dream schedule, create time freedom, and essentially passivize your business. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the episode. All right, Christina, I'm so excited to have you as part of my show, as part of the Female on Fire series, and I'm so excited for the listeners to learn from you today. So welcome to the show, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm excited to like this. I've been excited for this episode myself because this is something, the topic we're about to dive into is something that I've been really interested in myself. So this is super timely for me, and I'm sure it is for the listeners as well. Uh, I first would love to, uh, before we dive into all that juicy goodness, uh, to know how you came to be this de-commerce, as you call it, the de-commerce queen. (laughs) Well, thank you for that. I started my own online shop. I was a service-based provider. I was a lawyer that had a firm and clients and lots of stress from those clients who always needed me. Everything was an emergency to them, even though it wasn't in real life. Um, Try telling that to a client who's freaking out about something, right? They don't want to hear it. And I thought I needed a different way to just exist because that was not what lit me up. I I wasn't excited to answer emails at, you know, 5 PM on a Saturday when I'm trying to have drinks with friends or be with family or whatever. And I had a friend who uh, mentioned, she said, would it be okay if I just stole one of your templates that you use with clients? Like, I'll just use it for myself. I'm not going to sell it or anything. She's a photographer. And I said, yeah, that, that works. I mean, the open secret of lawyers is that they typically are working off of templates themselves and using that with every single client, because you're not going to reinvent the wheel every single time. Even if a client wants something custom, you're still going to start with that template and then customize it to that person. And that's what I I did. I I just kind of tweaked it and I was like, oh, this might be helpful for you. And I included this little section here and blah, blah, blah. And she looked at it and she said, this is amazing. You should be selling this. And I said, oh, that, that can't, that's not like a thing, you know, like legal zoom rocket lawyer, those things already exist. Like, who am I? No, one's going to want my stuff. Anyway, I started talking, I had a yoga business and blog at the time and business is a very generous word because it hadn't made a single money. In fact, I was $74,000 in credit card debt at that time. So I, I was really, the only way I was sustaining myself was through this client work. And I went ahead and started talking. This is where you really can get started from anywhere. I started talking about legal stuff on my yoga blog because that was my online presence. I didn't have like an online presence for talking about legal stuff other than, than this blog. So I did that and I started to get lots of traction, even without, you know, Pinterest, Facebook ads, weren't really a thing, like nothing. And it just started building momentum. Um, so then I went out and I did a JV webinar with the rising tide society. Um, I was their first ever webinar. And that was the first time I'd ever spoken publicly. I did a contracts one-on-one presentation 
didn't have anything for sale, just had this like idea from the friend and ended up pre-selling about $3,700 worth of products. So nothing's created, just made $3,700 just saying like, this store exists. And when you went to the store, it just had a bunch of product listings that when you checked out, there was nothing on the back end. It just was like a PDF or like an email or something that said, you know, this will be delivered within the next 14 days, which was really fast. Mm. I usually recommend like 30 now from that experience. <laughs> um, but that was how I got started way back in 2016. So that was January, 2016, obviously, you know, with people purchasing it, I made the products and then they became live. They were no longer on pre-sale and through a combination of content and networking and things like that, we we've gotten to where we are today with my online store last year, I ended up taking about eight months off because I kind of, even before the pandemic started, I mean, that just accelerated it, but I was just thinking, what am I doing with my life? You know, I, at the time and last, last January, January, 2020, I was single. I'm actually now engaged. So <laughs> spoiler. Congratulations. Alert. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it all happened very quickly. Um, but I was single. I was living in this tiny town of 2000 people. I had this online store that was doing well, but like, I just, you know, I'm four years into it. I don't know what my purpose is anymore. Kind of like one of those like existential business moments. And mm -hmm. I ended up stepping away from the store for eight months. Like just didn't touch it. Got into Voxer every day, made sure there was nothing on fire and you know, that our content was like still running, but like we didn't post to Instagram. We really didn't meet, email out newsletters. I just stopped blogging, like whatever was on Pinterest was on there and took this like eight month sabbatical to just try to figure things out. And towards the end of that, I, I had someone who pushed me again. <laughs> this is a common theme. This is why it's really important to listen to people like Ashley and show up at events and things like that, because these are the types of things that really helped you to extend outside whatever is holding you back. And like, for me, I just needed that little nudge that like, I, I did have something else to teach people. Um, you know, now with a shop that's running without me, I can go out there and teach people how to do the same thing. And like, I'm still doing it. So it's not like I'm, I'm teaching theory about what might work. It's, it's actually what's working in my store. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that, that was where I just made a shift. So I still have my shop. It's still running without me. I, I spend about five hours a month on it. I record a YouTube video for each week. Um, just batch that on one day. And that's all I do for my shop. Now it, it completely runs without me. Um, newsletter content, you know, everything coming out every week, all without me. Oh, so good. What I love about this is all the freedom and space that you created for yourself, uh, in this transition and choosing to go after this. And also what I love about this too, is you push through a very common, um, limiting conversation that people can have, which is, oh, well, you know, why me, uh, you know, oh, there's legal zoom and you can look at these, you know, like very well-known retailers and just give up in that moment and be like, not, nah, well, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not worth it. So I love that you like acknowledge that, yeah, that conversation came up and that you, you did it anyways. Is there something that kind of had you decide to like push through that story anyways, and to push through that conversation and, and give it a go? Was it that nudge that you were talking about from that, from that mentor that kind of helped you do that? Yeah. So that was actually a friend and this is a really good question. Oh, okay. No one's ever asked me this. It, it was definitely the friend and it was the fact that I had such a, a unique background. So I have three horses and she was an equine photographer. And, you know, I just said, you know, why don't, why don't you just go to legal zoom? Like there's photography contracts, whatever. And she said, well, I, I think she said this, um, at some point she said, basically she had some sort of contract or something, but it just, it wasn't good enough. Like there was, there was definitely, uh, something that I could bring to the table that like a normal lawyer who has no knowledge of like horses and equine law and that kind of thing. Um, they wouldn't have that to bring into this, this template. Um, same thing, like at the time I, I didn't really talk about this, but like, because I was doing my own yoga blog, I was doing a lot of graphic design. I had a logo design client. I feel so bad for her. It was probably the worst logo ever, but you know, I was, I was just trying to make money any way that I could when you're $74,000 in credit card debt, like you're pretty desperate. So that's what I was doing on the side is like calligraphy and graphic design. And, um, you know, this whole creative, you know, girl boss kind of attitude and, and industry was emerging and it gave you so many opportunities. And I was just kind of like scooping all of them up. I didn't know where to go. And at the time I was really distressed about it because I, I thought I'm trying to do too many things. And I'm also scared that if I pursue one thing, then I'll like neglect the thing that actually gets oh, me. Somewhere. I know. 
I know that conversation. I've heard that from my <laughs> clients too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I didn't know how this would all fit together. And then in hindsight, it all fit together beautifully because yeah. when I tried to be a calligrapher, I ran into issues with the clients that I was working with and, you know, conversations with them and things like that, that I was able to bring into the templates, you know, the, the calligrapher contract template or the graphic design contract template. I saw and felt and experienced the issues that I, I was actually having with these potential clients or these clients that actually worked with me. And it helped to bring in like just the most subtle nuances that you couldn't get from a big box legal site yeah. that just had a form template. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I love that. Um, one thing I, I've been saying lately um, to my clients and I'm just kicked off another round of my mastermind and sometimes I, you know, I get these women who are just so obsessed with wanting to know like the full game plan. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, listen, you don't need to see the entire staircase to take the first step, you know? And it, I feel like that's really what you did. And it's like, you didn't know where all of that was going to lead you. And you were, you know, in response mode of like, okay, I'm in debt. I'm going to try all these things. I'm just going to go where I'm being led. I'm going to take these steps. And like, it all ended up working so uh, divinely for you where you literally were able to take all of that experience that you just had and all of those things and, and uh, create a business that, that serves service-based professionals in, in such a um, connected way because you were connected to all of it <laughs> right, <laughs> because you exactly. were doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that you just, you know, I think, I, I hope that listeners you can take from that is like, just follow what you're being led to in each next moment. Like take those steps and trust that sometimes we cannot see the greater plan. <laughs> and if, as long as you just trust yourself in each of those moments, and it all works for you. Everything's, everything's for you. So I love that. It's just like a beautiful uh, story. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I would also, I love that you took eight months off, by the way, super cool. And your business was just running while you were doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So good. It, it um, didn't feel very good at the time. I'm not going to lie because it, it didn't come from this place of like, I'm going to take eight months off and be like a total boss about it. It was more like, I don't know what to do with my life. What did I just do? I, I, I just got out of a seven year relationship and moved to this tiny town in the Colorado mountains, like way out in the middle of nowhere, you know, like we're talking like, like three hours outside of Denver into, into the mountains. And, um, you know, so like, it's just like single little old me living in this like mountain town of nobody. Um, and then wondering what's next for my life because, you know, I thought it would look a lot different by then. And then it didn't. So it was just like eight months of trying to kind of figure out who I was and like what I was doing in business. And then also like what my life was going to look like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, uh, you taking that time for yourself is brave. Um, and I'm sure it felt super uncomfortable because we can get so used to like always doing, 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 doing. And then, so like when we're not doing, we're like, what, what the fuck? Like, what, 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 what am I doing? I'm doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, I could imagine yeah. how, how uncomfortable that, that must've felt. And also like, just what a beautiful unfolding that, that was for you um, and your journey and like where you are today. So honor you for that. That's, that's awesome. It's beautiful that you like push through that discomfort too. Um, yeah. So, okay. I would love to know, like, really first steps on how one, I'm super interested in this, like how one begins to productize their business and their, and their services. Like, I like this idea of, you know, passivizing your business and like cloning yourself essentially, right. By taking your service and, um, and, and breaking it down in such a way that it's actually, um, like it lives on and it's, uh, evergreen. So mm -hmm. how does one like begin to kind of break that down for themselves? You know, listeners who are in, who are either currently service-based professionals or who are um, soon to be service-based uh, professionals. Yeah, for sure. So this is definitely where we have to set our egos aside and realize that we can serve our clients. Well, really they'll become your customers, but you can serve the people who are coming to you for help without your actual involvement. And that that's actually something a mindset shift that's been really difficult for a lot of my clients to make is they're transitioning into de-commerce 
the first thing to recognize is what you're actually providing as a result for the people that you're working with, whether you're working as a coach or a copywriter or a designer, whatever your service-based background is. And I mean, I know coaches are kind of like service-based, but I'm saying that in like air quotes, because I realize I recognize like what coaches do is a little bit different, but if you are working, if you are getting on phone calls with clients, whether it's in a group or a one-on-one setting, that's really what I would consider service-based. And then something's happening as a result of that, either they're taking action or you're doing something for them. Um, that's really yeah. where you can look at what's happening, the results that you're creating with them on a consistent basis and figure out how you are creating those results. And bec- the, the reason why I say it's hard to remove your ego from it is because the first place people go is they think, well, it's just me. I'm just special. I just learned how to do this. I have this certification or that certification or like whatever it is. And so if you are stuck there, that's fine. You can stay there, but you're never going to be able to get out and turn your, your product or your services into a product because you're, you're still in like your ego is still involved in that. So if you can just remove that and look at the results that you're getting and then work backwards. So kind of break it down, going backwards and saying like, well, like, yes, I do. Let's just take PR for example. So if you're like a publicist and you get people onto TV shows or something, Yes, you do have lots of connections, but you could totally list those connections out into some sort of black book and sell that black book. It doesn't have to be cheap. Like there's no rule that says products have to be cheap. This could be like a thousand dollar black book that people get access to a contacts list. You could be, if the result that they're looking for is to get onto, you know, five TV shows in the next quarter, you could be looking at how you're actually getting people onto those TV shows. It could be like a pitch script that you're sending out. And there's certain things you're doing in that script that are effective at connecting with, with someone at the, the network and getting people onto that television show. So there's, there's elements there that you can repeat that we can put into some sort of template that you can then sell as a product. So it's really about looking at the things that you're sending out. And it's, it's, I think it's easier if you've been working with a lot of clients for a little bit of a longer time, like most of the people that I work with that are the most successful are coming to me during a period of burnout. So they've worked with a lot of people and they're just, they really can't work with, like, they can't take anybody else on. They've raised their prices. uh, They've limited their client schedule, but they like, they're now they're capped at the ceiling. So they're looking for new ways that are in an agency and are in a course in order to increase their income. And they're so effective at turning their services into products because they understand what the processes are, what the checklists are, what the um, standard operating procedures, those SOPs that are getting their clients, the results, and then they can take pieces of each of those things and pull them out and turn those into products. Another way to think of it is if you've ever created a course, there's oftentimes like extra worksheets and workbooks and things like, yeah, yeah, that you've created. Um, now this is provided that you didn't just like kind of mail it in with the worksheet because I've seen people do that. So we're going to assume that you didn't do that, but if it truly is like a worksheet or a script or something that you're including in your courses that does get people certain results, that would be great to pull out of that course and sell by itself. So you don't even have to create new things per se, if you already have things like that available in your course. Mm, I see. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Cause I was actually just going to ask you about that. Um, you know, like how, where courses would come into play because, you know, that's one thing me personally, I'm, I haven't even publicly launched this yet, but, um, I have, uh, like a high, I just was talking about my high level mastermind and, um, that, takes my time. Obviously I'm showing up to the calls. I'm, you know, it's a lot of me (laughs) involved in that. Right. right? And, um, and so I wanted to create something where it's like, all right, I don't have to be present, but they can get those learnings, those lessons. And yes, there's worksheets and things like that. So I'm creating like an online course that has the worksheets, like as part of it um, and selling that on its own. I haven't even launched it yet, but I'm like, man, Mm. this is exciting. Cause I'm like, I was, I literally was thinking like, okay, if I sold, just sold a hundred of those in a month or whatever, right. I sold a hundred, that would be a hundred thousand dollars, right. For the price I'm selling it at. So it's just like, holy smokes. And it's like, 
infinitely scalable, you know, versus like my mastermind can only a certain amount of people can be in there because obviously right. like, so it's just such a fun way to start thinking about things. And like, I didn't reshoot any of those videos. Those are just, I just repackaged and repurposed past mastermind live calls and Amazing. made it into yeah. like, yeah, you know what I mean? So it's, I love this concept and, you know, really creating something that, uh, that doesn't, I mean, we're, we're, we have finite, we're, we have finite amount of time and space. Like I, my calendar is freaking loaded and I'm sure <laughs> listeners, you can relate to that feeling. Right. So then it's like, all right, if everything you're doing requires your time, well, at some point there's like, there's a cap there, you know, you have, yeah, you have this finite amount of time every week. So I love this, this idea of just really maximizing your possibility and, and your, success by creating these, these, you know, by productizing your business. And by the way, really quick, I just want to add, we didn't say, but D-commerce guys, just in case you're like, what is e-commerce? It stands for digital commerce, right? Yeah. So like e-commerce is typically drop shipped and, you know, Amazon, things like that. D-commerce yeah. is digital download products sold through an online storefront. Love it. Love it. And so what, um, what would you say, you know, I'm sure you work with your clients on, on creating these, you know, these de-commerce, um, stores, what would you say is like a, a common mistake or a biggest mistake that people would make in, um, creating these online shops? Yeah. I think the biggest mistake is, well, other than just waiting <laughs> and sitting on it, uh, I, I'm a big fan of pre-selling. I told you guys how I pre-sold. I think a lot of people let their mindset blocks hold them back from pre-selling there. Honestly, the biggest mistakes are going to come down to function. So if you are not making sales through an online store and you're thinking, what is going on? Mm -hmm. it, it comes down to traffic first. So if you're getting enough people that are coming to your store and then, um, they're not checking out, that's, that's a conversion issue. So if, if you're getting enough people, we want to make sure we're getting enough traffic in. That's the first maybe mistake or area to look at. If you're only getting a hundred people to look at your shop products a month, you know, that's, that's kind of obvious why you're not making sales. There's just not enough people seeing it. And then on the back end, if you have, like, I just was looking at a client's shop. She has about 1500 people a month coming to her store but only two people purchased. And so when I went through and I looked, the functional stuff is always going to hang you up and cut down your conversions. And this happens a lot with shops too, because they're a little bit different than like the traditional funnel. And, you know, like maybe what, what you might be used to in types of funnel software or like carts or things like that, because they're just a little bit more, there's a little bit more going on. So like Squarespace and Shopify are my favorite platforms because they help to simplify what's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, they really help to streamline that checkout process for people, but on her shop, for example, and this happens a lot, she didn't even have like a cart icon or anything. It was really hard to find my cart once I clicked out of it. So the, the function is going to always hold someone back. So, um, it like, if you are missing any kind of cart checkout icon, if it's difficult for someone to move through the checkout process, if they click away from their cart and there's no way for them to find it. Uh, I've seen stores where they can't figure out why no one's buying from them. And then I go and their cart page is a 404. <laughs> so these are really simple things. But if you just look at it from the perspective of your customer and say, what is just logistically, how are they moving through this process and where are they getting hung up? That's going to save you a lot of time and heartache later, because these are things that you just fix once and you never have to work on again. You can optimize, you know, more important, more integral pieces of that cart or excuse me, of that customer's journey rather than just like the functional checkout yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So true. Um, and then when you talk about tr getting traffic, is it like SEO, like search engine optimization, or is it like webinars that you're doing or how are like for someone who's like just starting out, how do they, how would you advise them to start getting that initial traffic to their shops? Sure. My favorite way when you're starting out is through joint ventures. So that could look like a blog post, like a guest blog post on someone else's platform. If you're comfortable doing presentations or going live on their platform, that might also be a great way to do this. Oh, and yeah. because the thing is, I mean, you know, creating a podcast, it's always hard to think of new, interesting, innovative topics that are going to capture someone's attention. So if I did that as, you know, like, let's pretend like I'm a, a newbie, 
I don't have any audience. You know, there's 10 people on my email list. Five of them are my own, just checking that emails are going through kind of thing. If I approached you and, you know, even if I don't have any experience or, you know, maybe I start with like someone who is a little bit newer than you are. Right. So like, I'm not, I'm not going for the top right away. I'm going for like kind of an interim level. Um, I would approach them and I would say, Hey, like, I know you have like an audience of like a thousand. I actually have this great topic that would be a fit for them. And this is what I would talk to your audience about. And like, these are some of the things that we would cover. Basically, I just come to you with a topic and like a bullet point list of what I could cover. And then we decide what medium that's going to happen in. Is it going to be a blog post? Is it going to be a webinar? That kind of thing. And Mm. you put me in front of your audience and then I present this new and exciting information or topic to them that's complementary to something that you do. And so that's my favorite way to build an audience for free as you're getting started. The only catch I'd say is that a lot of people will pitch what they think is a really interesting or engaging topic and it's not. So you just Mm -hmm. have to make sure that that is, is actually a very interesting topic to maximize the the return on that investment that that person's making in you uh, and the investment that you're making in creating this content for the, their platform. So basically trading content for an audience. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It needs to be of, of a high perceived value. Um, yeah, that's so good. I love that. Um, I also call it, yeah, collaborations, collaborating with, with others. Um, there's, uh, this technique that my, uh, friend and mentor Shanda Sumter, I don't know if you've heard of her, she yeah. uses where they do Oh yeah. Where she does her online summits where she invites experts in and it's like such a cool way to get, you know, that initial like traction in, Mm -hmm. um, in a business or in a launch of a, of a product or, um, or of a, of a, an offer. So yeah, I love it. Love that. So good. And I also just want to highlight something that you've, you've said a couple of times, which is that concept of pre-selling, uh, for the listeners, because it's, it's such a, it's like something that most of us, we just don't think about doing, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, let let's because first off you're like validating the offer before you even invest all the time energy resources into like building it out you know it gives you an opportunity to vet it and see does this actual do people want this you know is this something that people would actually buy like i i actually um even when it comes to you know live live stuff like my live when i first my mastermind, when I first launched that, I actually hadn't even created an, any outline or anything for it. I just was like, let's see if, you know, people could use this, you know, support and and guidance around their brand. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then, so it was like, okay, cool. And then once I got, I like, think I filled it like 60 or 70% full and I was like, all right, I can start kind of building out the plan now, but it's such a cool, you know what I mean? Like, I love that you brought that to light. So listeners, like, and you don't need to have the entire staircase built out before you take the first step, you know, right back to what we we're talking about before. So, so good. I just want to really highlight that. Um, I think a lot of people forget that that's an easy, easy, easy thing that they can do right away when they have an idea for a product or service. So cool. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I didn't, um, I also wanted to know your thoughts on focus, Uh, Like when someone is, um, you know, like deciding to launch a product or maybe a series of products, uh, like what is your idea about, you know, should they be laser focusing in on, on like a niche or on one thing or multiple things? Like, how do you usually approach that? Yeah, I would say focus in on a result. And you can expand it out to different niches. So for example, when I started, I focused mostly on, excuse me, on photographers. So like that was the overall niche, but I really focused on like, what result did I want to bring for these photographers? And I wanted them to be able to work with their clients more quickly and in a way that felt that made them feel more confident and capable of doing so. And so when I knew that we were going to hit on photographers and then, you know, the pre-sale products took off with them, then I, I layered in different other specialties that I was familiar with, calligraphy, floral design, wedding planners. Mm. And it's interesting, most of our businesses actually shifted away from wedding planners, but that was really how I started is I, I looked again at that result and applied it to them. And then, you know, with that core product, it's, it's not that we're, you know, re- you don't, and I wouldn't encourage people to do this, but like, it's not that we're reinventing new products every single time. We're really just taking a core foundation 
of each product and iterating it, making it nuanced to each of the different niches. So that's what mm. I would look at is like your core product's going to get someone a result, no matter what they, who they are, what they do, but then you can layer on those nuances in that niche to really help sell it a little bit better. So for example, if I was like a copywriter and I wanted people to have kick-ass sales pages, I would, that that's the result that I'm looking for is an amazing sales page that helps people to get conversion rates of like, you know, 10 plus percent off their, just their sales page, that kind of thing. So that's a result, mm -hmm. but I might also layer on that niche of, you know, a health coach. And so I will build that page out just as is to get the result. And then I can layer on the nuances of that, that a health coach might experience. So like, they're going to have specific objections that relate to someone's body and, you know, weight and things like that versus I can take that same basic core product that just the, the kick-ass sales page. And I could build it out for a graphic designer who wants to sell her graphic design services. Now th that client who's looking for design services is going to have a totally different set of objections and things that she wants than the health coach. Right. So it's the same basic template, like same format, same section, same things like that, same kind of like language. But if you think about it, you could just like ad lib in whatever it is that that specific industry is up against and overcoming for their clients uh, in order to convince them that this is something that they need. So that's where it, it's not, I actually think being more simple and, and more focused in this way where you're looking at the core product is really helpful. Um, I think too, too often people approach it from like a top down approach rather than bottom up. So what I'm suggesting is like, we have this foundation, you approach it there and then like build on top of it. I think too many people are looking at successful products and successful product creators and saying, how can I copy this? How can I make something that is also going to do this for my brand and for me? And they're only seeing like the final package. So they're not looking at like the roots and, and what it took to get to that finished product. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Really working your way, working backwards. Yeah. That's yeah. so good. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Like, I feel, I feel clear on that now. That's, that's cool. I was even like looking at, you know, I, my, part of my business builds, we build websites, um, for conscious leaders, for heart centered, purpose driven personal brands. And my, my brain's already kind of churning with things right now and ideas. So nice. awesome. I love these kinds of conversations. Um, okay. Well, Christina, we're like at the end of the episode, I feel like that flew by, um, <laughs> <laughs> like definitely flew by. Uh, well, I do have one final question that I ask all the ladies who come on my female on fire series. And that is what is something that about yourself that you used to dim, uh, maybe hide mute or even shame, uh, that you have since reactivated and reignited on your journey to becoming the female on fire that you are today? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can be kind of weird. Like I can be kind of, you know, goofy and have like this offbeat sense of humor. And I, I actually, in my, my last relationship, that seven year relationship, he would really make fun of me for that. And like, I love dance music and he would make fun of me when I would play that and say, it's like, you know, whatever. So I, I started, you know, playing that music and putting in the background of my reels and just kind of being goofy and the, the weird person that I can be on my Instagram stories. And that's felt really good beyond that though. It's actually helped me to connect with people who are like soulmate level clients. Yeah. Be yeah. Because they, they're like, you do that weird thing. I do that weird thing. So then, you know, maybe it's not that weird in reality, but nobody talks about it. Um, you know, I posted a story this weekend. I, I, I was wedding dress shopping and I flew to Seattle to see my mother-in-law and do it with her. And on the way back, I was talking about like this weird thing that I have about this, the seat that I always get on the Southwest flights. And I got so many comments from that people being like, what? Tell me more. Like, what is the seat? What is this like magic that you're talking about? And, and I was just like, literally like, I'm such a weirdo. I love the seat and I, I can't stand it sitting anywhere else. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's just stuff like that, that, and that's probably not a great example. Like there's definitely things I do that are a little bit more resonant. Um, but that really connected with people and hit home. And so I think just leaning into that weirdness, like whatever that otherness is that you feel 
can be yeah. incredibly helpful. Yeah. And liberating. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. it. It's it, And I love what you said too. It's, it attracts your soul clients. It attracts your soul tribe, like your soul friendships too, your soul partner, <laughs> because now you're, you're, you know, what I call magnetic because mm. you're being yourself, you're being your 360 degree self, your full self. And I got weird in me too, girl. I'm definitely a weirdo. And I have a man who is <laughs> just as equally, if not more weird than me. So we, uh, we're just like, so it's so great. And I've also been in those relationships. Um, like I can resonate with you a lot. I'm sure a lot of women listening can too, where, you know, being made wrong and that feeling of like, like, Oh, like, what are you doing? Or can you not, can you not do that? You know? And you're just like, mm. yeah. and, and I really think, you know, I, be, I believe, I truly believe that we attract in those relationships and um, we, they are actually reflections of how we are still not accepting those parts of ourselves. So then when we finally do accept and allow ourselves to express those parts of ourselves, we attract in the person who like totally loves and accepts those parts of us too. Um, and, and same goes with clients. I'm talking all relationships. So uh, embracing the weird, embracing the weirdness. I love it. So good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Christina. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm going to put all the links of course, so that the, you know, the listeners can stalk you and check out your online shop and, and all the things. Is there anything else that you would like me to, uh, include in the show notes there or, and also put your Instagram so they can go follow your weirdness there too. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm Christina Scalera everywhere. And, um, anybody who's listening could do Ashley a huge favor and just leave her a five-star rating and review because I don't think people know how much work podcasts are, but that helps out so much. Mm. Oh, thank you, Christina. You're like the first, I think you're the first person that's ever said that at the end of a, of a podcast. So love it. Women supporting women. So good. Thank you for, Absolutely. for that, Christina. That's so sweet. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Finally, you guys, we, we were like back and forth trying to make this episode happen for like the last couple of months or whatever it's been. But um, I, I always trust in divine timing. So I'm sure that the episode coming out at the time that it's coming out is perfect for all you listening. So thank you, Christina, for being a part of this series and coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ashley. Mm -hmm. 